pop in of my own child, Tabitha. Um, apparently, when I communicated to my husband that I needed coverage for this time frame, he assumed that meant take one child and go get something to eat and leave everybody else at home. So, <laughs> so we may have little pop-ins here and there, but um, communication is key, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, I thought what I'd start with today is just an overview of something I go with uh, over with, with parents when I first do a behavioral consultation, because I think um, some of these issues may apply to many of you. And if you're hearing it more in a general um, setting with some examples, you may go, aha, uh, and, and how you can use that information in your own family. Um, and then, of course, Melissa's going to jump in because I'm sure she's had multiple, multiple examples of some of these issues. And then um, I'm hoping, you know, we can be done in about maybe 45 minutes and spend the rest of the time doing some Q&A, just um, some specific things that you're struggling with that maybe don't get covered in the general overview. So, um, Carly, if you want to pull up um, the handout, and if you all want a copy of this, um, I don't know if you can do a screenshot or if you want me to email it to you, to Carly, um, and you can have access to it. So I always talk to parents about behavior is communication. Um, for those of us who have a child with um, a language issue and probably is a pervasive language issue, has been around for a while, um, many times our children communicate with us in behavior because it is a little bit faster than trying to find those words or make that sentence um, or remember those signs. So I always tell parents, if you're seeing a behavior, what do you think your child's trying to let you know? And when we talk about discipline, um, some families get a little nervous. Like, what does that mean? Discipline, we're, we're not a punitive family. But really, discipline is just teaching. It is teaching, how, um, teaching your child how to get their needs met appropriately. And that's what we want for all of our children from the time they're born. We just want them to be able to navigate their environment and get their needs met appropriately. Um, and so I'm gonna reiterate this later in the talk, but I like to start early. So I give parents, um, you know, about a year, I say, okay, just spoil that baby for about 12 to 18 months, right? And then by 18 months, we're gonna wanna have something in place. We're gonna wanna have a discipline plan or program or some modification of what you have done with your other children in your home because we want them off to a good start. Um, and the beginning of this, I, this whole handout is applicable for other caregivers and teachers too. So I, I talk about when do I usually see inappropriate behavioral responses. Um, and the first one right there is when it's worked, <laughs> right? Because we all learn very, very young um, what works to get our needs met and our wants met. Um, as soon as we learn cause and effect, we know we can scream and someone comes running, right? And that's why I like to start early. So uh, many times our children and adults are doing something because it's worked for them in the past. Um, and we've got to unlearn, you know, a, a, a habit uh, that hasn't maybe been as socially appropriate as we'd like it to be. Um, inappropriate behaviors are often a result of communication. You know, our members have difficulty communicating uh, when they're tired, when they're sick, um, when they're angry or frustrated, and it can come out as a swat, a throw, a kick, um, a plop to the floor, um, whatever that looks like for your child. Um, I really caution teachers and um, some of our professionals when they work with our children that sometimes behavior is because of their processing speed, uh, especially with auditory processing speed delays. We just need to give them a little more time after we give a direction, give ample time for them to respond, um, using simple verbal prompts with short words and phrases, not giving them too many instructions at one time. That was really important. <laughs> And also um, difficulties reading subtle social cues. Um, we think our children that have Down syndrome are very social, which they can be. However, um, sometimes I call it that social savvy. They might need some direct training in, in gaining social savvy skills. And by that, I mean reading a room, reading other people, um, respecting personal space. Um, one thing I see sometimes with young children is, you know, they want to run up to, to Brutus, who's at the top of the slide like this, 
you know, Brutus just got really irritated and is like this, and, and our child may want to run up and give him a big hug at the top of the slide, and then is surprised when they go catapulting off of the slide. So learning how to read body language um, to, to have a social situation uh, work out for the best. And, and I usually share this example with teachers. I'll often go into classrooms because there's um, an inappropriate behavior reported for one of our members. And while I'm trying to be a fly on the wall and I'm observing the classroom, I'm seeing, yes, our, our member with DS is engaging in some inappropriate behavior, but they're modeling that behavior of other students. And so there might be three or four students in the classroom doing the same thing. But when Mrs. Jones, the teacher, turns around, the other students know to put hands in their lap, look back at the teacher. They have that social um, savvy. I call it. Yes, yeah, that social awareness that, uh-oh, keep one eye on the teacher while you're misbehaving over here, where many times our members don't have that. Um, experience and they're still engaged in the misbehavior. And so um, being the advocate for our students, sometimes I'll say, you know, is Johnny the only one in the class doing that behavior or is he the only one getting caught <laughs> of that behavior? So then that's one way our members, not that we want to teach them to be a little more sneaky, but, um, you know, they need to be more socially aware of their whole environment. Um, so the next bullet point I talk about is reinforcement. I'm, I'm really big on reinforcement and I'm, I'm sure Melissa will echo this too. Reinforcement yeah. applies to all people and all behavior. Um, and that is really providing something positive or taking away something negative after a behavior occurs in order to get that behavior repeated. And with our members, I love using social rewards. We know research has even fleshed this out and our members are very socially driven uh, for the most part. You know, we, we do have some of our members have a dual diagnosis maybe and aren't as socially motivated. But typically, praise, smiles, high fives, thumbs up, good, good work, I'm proud of you, um, a simple yes when they've gotten something that they've been working on can be really uh, more motivating than maybe um, something tangible. So oftentimes if we're trying to reward our young ones with stickers or um, I'm never opposed to food rewards, but sometimes those aren't even as, as effective as just a social reward. Um, but remember that we really wanna reinforce that behavior every single time we see a positive behavior. It's, you know, whatever you want to be repeated, reinforce. Whatever you don't want to be repeated, don't reinforce. And I joke with couples, this works in marriages as well. You know, every time hubby takes the trash out, you do a little social you know, reinforcement. Um, and any, every time your child's trying to get your attention, mom, 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 you know, you don't reinforce that. You look away, walk out of the room. Sometimes it's very, very challenging. Um, but when you use praise, I really encourage families to be genuine and specific because our members are, are so smart, I think, with people and can really um, know when someone's being ingenuous. Um, so being very positive, happy, great work. I like that. Nice job. Um, and specific. So, oh, I like how you picked up your room. I love those walking feet, wonderful hands. Being as specific as you can because you want them to repeat what they're getting praised for. And if they don't know because you haven't told them, they're not gonna know what to repeat. Um, and I learned that lesson actually from um, a very young child I was working with and I kept saying, good job, good job, yay, good job. And she looked at me and said, I don't work. <laughs> so she was thought, you know, she had a job, she was working. And I learned, aha, you, um, yeah, you're right. You know, your job's being a child. Um, but she didn't really know what I was praising her for. She couldn't really put her finger on it. She'd done 12 different things. So, um, you know, I really like to be very specific because you want that behavior repeated. Um, and prevention's a great one. I always talk about prevention. I'm one who, I don't like swimming upstream. So if you can get the situation to go the way you need it to go, 
um, that is wonderful. Identifying triggers um, that you know might set your child off and eliminate these. And I always am astonished, you know, when I go into Walmart late at night and there's the two-year-old plopping on the floor and having a tantrum and parents are surprised that they're having a tantrum and it's 1030 at night and they're tired. <laughs> It's like, I don't blame that child for having a meltdown. It's bedtime. This is not where they want to be. Um, so trying to identify those situations um, where they're going to be melting down um, and try to eliminate those as much as possible. And I, and I say this, uh, you know, you want to have a fine line. So some parents kind of take this too far and feel like they have to walk on eggshells and they have to create an environment in their home and community that is so personalized and tailored uh, to that person that they really don't bump up against any frustrations. And that's not what I'm talking about. It's just the major things. If you know we can have a more positive day by adjusting your schedule or adjusting the environment, tweaking some things, let's do that because you really want to build on that positive momentum. And I'll share um, an example. I was working with a family. Um, there, there was a grandma raising a grandchild and, and the grandchild did not have down syndrome, but the grandmother's home was immaculate. It looked like a museum, you know, every little glass, porcelain, tchotchke everywhere. And so the young child, of course, wanted to touch everything and got their hands smacked every time they reached for something. And so we talked about, you know, having some things that weren't um, family heirlooms out that would be off limits. But the things you know were your precious grandmother's thing that she brought over from the old country maybe put up, <laughs> or at least until the child's old enough. Because um, you don't want, that's 50 negative encounters, you know, you're having with that child all day long, smacking their hand, because things are just so tempting in their environment. So that's sort of what I'm talking about is having some things that are going to be practiced for frustration and, and learning the rules, but not have your schedule or your environment so full of negative potential negative opportunities that it makes it really hard to kind of get going on a positive positive language or positive um, momentum which takes us to the next point um, you know providing directions and explanations that are brief using consistent language i love when mom and dad and grandma and babysitter teacher are all using the same verbal prompts and cues. Mm -hmm. um, so we say walking feet when we want Johnny to walk instead of no walking, because what do you hear last when you hear, or no running, no running. You know, I hear running, you know, running, I wanna do that. Um, and as a parent, I experienced this too. Tabitha went through a spitting phase and I fell right into the trap, no spitting. And she looked at me, spitting. <laughs> So, you know, lips are for kissing, lips are for talking, um, you know, remind your child what you want them to do versus what you don't want them to do. And there's, there really is some neurological basis for this with our members because their auditory memory is more brief than their visual memory. And they truly um, hear the last thing we tell them. So we want to give them that positive direction. And then phrasing or how we say something can really make or break it. Um, I'm sure you all have examples of when you've given your child a direction um, and it's been in a positive matter of fact way. All right, time to get in the car. Let's go for an adventure. That sounds much more fun and enticing than, all right, get in the car. <laughs> um, stop that, stop what you're doing, stop and go. Uh, you know, we really want to present things as a, as a positive. I know no can be a trigger word for a lot of our members, mm -hmm. um, especially our adults who've heard it for years and years and years. As soon as they hear no, boom, immediately the defenses go up and they want right. to, to have a power struggle over that. So just how we say something. Um, sometimes I'll do coaching with our moms, not to pick on our moms, but you know, we often have this nice little T voice. And when we give an instruction, we, we raise our voice an octave at the end, or we'll say, okay, um, time to clean up, okay? You know, because I think sometimes we're, we're trying to check in for comprehension. Um, all done TV, okay? You know, and for our, our child, that sounds like, well, is it okay with me? And mom's asking me if it's okay. It's not really okay. I don't want to do that. 
Um, it sounds more of a question. So practicing in front of a mirror and just making a statement versus a, a question. Um, you know, it's cleanup time, time to clean up. And we just make it a statement, matter of fact, kind of positive. Um, even before that, you might want to set a timer, which is some additional strategies we'll get into. But really think how you, how you present something can make or break it. Mm -hmm. um, and practice those skills. So the big one I think uh, we're going to talk about too is really assessing, I call it the motivation for behavior. Some people call it the, the function of the behavior. What's the purpose of the behavior? But I think that has to be really step one. So once you've tried your preventative techniques and you're still encountering some issues, let's figure out what the reason for the behavior is because not all um, behavior serves the same purpose. I often have families will ask, well, my child's biting, so what do you do about biting? <laughs> well, why are they biting, right? Is it they're teething and they're putting everything in their mouth and they want to chew on your arm like it's a yummy dog treat? Um, that could be a sensory thing, so we want to address that. Is Are they biting because they're trying to tell you something? They, want, they don't want to do something, and when I bite you, you stop doing whatever it is I don't want to do. Um, is it attention seeking? You're on the phone and I'm going to bite you because I know you'll, ow, and you'll immediately stop your conversation and give me all your attention. So I think you, we really need to figure out what the function of the behavior is. It's not so much the actual behavior as often it is why um, our members are engaging in, in that behavior. And before I, before I jump into that, I, I really want to say the first thing I often will do is look at any potential underlying health issues that could be contributing to behavior. And I, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we, we overlook this, we immediately go to it's a major behavioral issue. And it could be, but I think we also need to rule out um, anything that could be going organically with our member that could explain some behavior. And I'll often see this in if it's a new behavior, kind of an acute situation where Johnny has been a mellow guy for years and years, and all of a sudden he's uh, throwing chairs and pushing people and screaming um, what could be going on. And, and I have had this actual, um, several of these situations present before where I've gone through, okay, Johnny's going, he's, um, you know, going through hormones and we're having some staff changes at school and things are tough at home. And so we're getting this really deep behavior kind of analysis and plan going on. And and the mom tells me in the course of the conversation that I am taking him to the pediatrician today because he hasn't been sleeping well. I think he might have a sinus infection. Well, and it turns out Johnny has a massive sinus infection necessitating double round of antibiotics, but three days into our antibiotic uh, regimen, the behavior goes away. <laughs> so I think, you know, Johnny probably was in chronic pain um, and wasn't sleeping and that could account for some of the behavior. Um, and it doesn't have to be a new behavior. I think, you know, our members have several health-related issues that could contribute to um, some behavior, thyroid, uh, constipation, ear infections, anytime they're not feeling well, their sleep is disrupted, um, it's, it's a good time to, to look at those potential health issues. So once we've ruled out, you know, that it might be a medical or health-related issue, I typically next look at sensory. So has, has the member been working with an OT for a while and they have sort of a sensory profile already established. We know what's working, what's not working as far as their sensory seeking behavior or avoidant behavior. Um, and then tweaking the environment because if, if the classroom, the home, if you can make some easy changes that the whole family can live with and that really reduces a behavior, that is so much easier, um, I think. And it plus it's giving that the environment that really is going to match what our members need, um, which is going to help long term. Um, so if it's a sensory seeking or avoidant behavior, and then I'll give you an example. This is an example I use quite a bit. I was doing a consultation at a daycare facility and the staff thought that this child um, couldn't be managed in the typical preschool classroom because he was always having meltdowns at um, fine motor time. So anytime they came in from the playground and sat down to the table to do some fine motor tasks where it was handwriting, stringing beads, whatever, 
he was under the table. And once I spent you know, several hours in the classroom, what became an, something I observed is the acoustics in the room were not great. So it's a very echoey, hollow room. Um, they were doing fine motor time right after they came off the playground. And so kid, all kids were ramped up. There was a lot of noise. They'd come right in, sit down to the table, and sure enough, little you know Johnny was underneath the table, hand over his ears, kind of doing the rocking thing. Talked to the staff. They were very agreeable to tweak their routine. Kids came in off the playground, got a drink of water, washed hands, had a little quieting activity, then went over to the table. We got uh, Johnny some noise canceling headphones. All of a sudden he's sitting at the table participating. So it wasn't the activity necessarily that was the trigger for him. It was just all the sensory stimulation in the room. He couldn't handle it and was finding a way to to drown a little bit of that out. So I think finding out um, exactly what's going on is, is key. Um, the second point here, attention seeking behavior. We all know that. If you've got children, we've seen that. And um, unless it's dangerous, unless it's potentially dangerous or harmful, my rule of thumb is you ignore it. You ignore that mild, annoying, distracting behavior. Um, you, and usually when you ignore something, it gets worse. <laughs> so we see that. It's going to you know, have to up the ante. We get louder. Mom, 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 mom. <laughs> and usually for parents where we have our breaking point is right up here. So we reinforce the behavior at the, at the apex, at the, at the climax of the behavior. So the next time that Johnny wants to get your attention, he goes right up here versus slowly stepping up. I'm just going to go screaming your name at the top of my lungs. So we try to work with parents on hold tight, hold tight, because once you ignore that inappropriate behavior and they're learning that's not meeting their need, I'm not getting your attention, it tends to reduce. Simultaneously, we want to give them the attention for something positive. And so if they can stop mom, 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 and look out the window at something, that's when we give them the attention. Oh. You found the squirrel out there. That's awesome. What's he doing? You know, I've immediately given you my attention for something that's not mom, 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 <laughs> something appropriate. So we want to give the attention for those times when they are being appropriate. And I think sometimes that's where we forget. We're good at the ignoring, but we forget, okay, how do we get the attention? If the need is the attention, how, what are we going to do to, to make sure we're meeting that need? The third point um, is avoidant or escape or delay behavior. And I don't know about Melissa, but this is probably where I see 85% of behavior. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I would say with children and many of our adults as well, they don't want to mm -hmm. do something. They figured out how to get out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So with young children, that's why I love when parents start early and we talk about it is so much easier to get your child on the right path when they're younger. Because for that avoidant behavior, I'm gonna help you do the activity. And by help, the young child, that might be picking you up and moving you over to the area. That might be some hand over hand assistance. That might be, I do one block, you do the next block, and I'm gonna give you all the praise and the credit because you're amazing. Um, but that's, it's much easier to start when they're younger and you can move the child where you, <clears throat> excuse me, need them to be. Because when they're a, uh, a hefty nine-year-old or an impossible to move 26-year-old, you've sort of lost some traction there. So if you can start early. And I know Melissa's got great strategies on if you are <laughs> in those latter uh, age groups, how can we, you know, kind of get things back on the right track. Um, if for older children, I talk to families about waiting them out, especially if, mm -hmm. if what they're going to miss out on is really reinforcing. So, okay, if you're not going to do this, then we're just going to sit here. And that means you don't get to go to the movies afterward. No. Yeah, you make it their choice. You say, that's fine. You don't have to do this, but this is what you're going to miss out on. So you either do this, then movies, or you don't do this, and then we're not going to go to the movies type thing. And it works. And I think Melissa does a great job too of helping um, your members feel like they're part of the process. So it's not something that's being done to them. 
it's they're making the choice. They're an active participant in how this is all going to play out. Um, and right. I think that's really important. And then the last category that um, I don't see quite as much with our members um, is the aggressive or destructive. So you've told um, your child, no, you can't have that. So they smack you across the face or they pick up your phone and throw it across the room. Um, and, and whatever developmentally appropriate discipline strategy your family has agreed on, whether that's grounding, removal of privileges, um, timeout. I, I say timeout and really when I'm talking about timeout is more of like a cool down, cool down time. So if children are escalated, they're, they're tantruming, they're screaming, they're crying, that's not a time that they're learning. So that's not a time when we're going to lecture or, um, you know, might not even do a first then at that time. It's okay. We just need to cool down, regroup, you know, make everybody safe. I'm going to remove you from anything sharp <laughs> or the other siblings in the home. Um, and, and we'll just have a cool down and then we'll talk about it. So further down um, in this handout are some examples of, uh, and I've gone over a few verbally here, but you can kind of read um, things that we've talked about, sensory-based behavior, trying to redirect um, to a sensory activity while avoiding reinforcing the inappropriate behavior. And I'll give you an example on that. Um, so if our members will often need more proprioceptive sensory input, they like that deep pressure into their joints and muscles. That can be um, throwing for our young children. When you throw, boy, that feels great. You get a zippy feeling in your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder, uh, pulling hair. That feels really good, not to the person's hair being pulled, but to me, <laughs> because I'm, I'm getting that uh, resistance. Um, petting the cat like this. <laughs> that feels good to me, not the cat. Um, so those are some examples of, of where that sensory need might come in and ways to redirect. Um, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have lycra bands that we pull on. We're gonna, if we're gonna throw toys, we're gonna set that up as an activity where we get some heavy balls and we throw them in the buckets so that we right. don't need to throw all of our toys you kind of work in that sensory seeking um, throughout the day and especially before times where you don't want to see it. So it might be sedentary times, structured learning times, um, but making sure that they are getting that sensory need because it's not going to go away if we ignore it. It's going to be ever present and we just want to make sure that they are um, getting that need met and, and they know their body. They're learning what their body needs and finding ways to go uh, meet that need. I'll, I'll never forget when my daughter Tabitha was about six and she she was a very much a sensory seeker. You know, toys were getting chucked and the cat was getting <laughs> pet much too hard. But when she got the therapy ball, the big Pilates ball, and got it out of the corner and started bouncing on it, um, I was like, ah, you know what your body needs and you know how to get that met appropriately and you're doing it yourself. Um, so that's very, very important. Well, it's replacing it to a positive and more appropriate to, you know, society and community as well. Because um, throwing a ball in the classroom is not appropriate, but if you're throwing the ball with a peer on the playground, that is appropriate. And so you work in that replacement. That's how it kind of happens that way. Absolutely. And on the flip side, you know, our members aren't always just one, you know, one type of sensory issue, uh, sensory seeking, but there can be some sensory aversions. Um, so something's can be too loud, too fast, the smells are too strong, um, and they can react to that. And we want to make sure we're helping to identify what those triggers are for them and, and knowing what they are and trying to help them manage that as much as possible, knowing we can't, you know, have life always being the red carpet in front of them <laughs> throughout their whole life. We are going to have frustrations and that's just how it is uh, with life, but how to, how to manage that um, as best that we can. And for our adults, knowing their own bodies, I think is really, really important. Um, and talking about, hey, we're going to be going out in the community today and we're going to be going past, I'll throw like Heine Brothers, you know how they grill, they do their own coffee grounds and sometimes that smell, is so strong um, and we're gonna be going past that. And so if you have really a lot of um, 
olfactory aversions that could be upsetting for you. Um, so knowing that's super important. Um, I'm trying to think of anything new that's in here under annoying or attention seeking. Obviously anything potentially dangerous, you don't want to ignore. Oh, I, I love um, talking to families about even eye contact can be reinforcing. So we think we're ignoring, but we're staring right at them. <laughs> and they know we're staring right at them, right? So um, just, you know, try to avert your eyes, making sure they're safe. You might, be, you could even be within arms uh, reach, but busy yourself folding towels or fluffing pillows or whatever you need to do. Um, but not giving that that attention and and you know when it's a true attention seeking behavior you've probably all seen this when the child throws themselves on the floor and you step over them and they get up and then throw themselves back on the floor in front of you <laughs> that's probably more of an attention seeking uh, need um, and then the escape or avoidant or delay behavior we talked a little bit about that and I know uh, Melissa's going to have a lot of good examples too um, especially how that manifests itself um, as our members become older. And they can become quite excellent problem solvers. I always say our members are brilliant when it comes to getting out of things. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, one of my favorite examples is when I went into a rural school. Um, this was the only student that they'd had with Down syndrome and they all loved him so much and they wanted him to be successful. But every day at math time, they were finding he was getting sent to the principal's office. Every day, we don't know what it is. He's, he's you know, hitting students or throwing books or, but it always is about the same time of day. Well, he didn't like math. Math was very challenging for him and he was trying to get out of math was my suspicion. But then when he got out of math, they sent him to the principal's office, but the principal just loved him and he got to get good quality time with the principal and she had toys and candy in her office. And so, I mean, I would be having uh, meltdowns at math time too, if that was my, you know, reinforcer. Uh, so we have to, you know, talk about how brilliant our members are at, at trying to get out of something. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why don't we scroll down a little bit? Sorry, I've got my helper. <laughs> Um, so, um, I think some more miscellaneous strategies, ways to increase attention span and appropriate transitions. I'll just leave that there for you to peruse. I, we talk a lot about first and then strategies as Melissa demonstrated and we even use um, first and then visuals. So, mm -hmm. I, I love those for our children. I think I've got one set up here. Hopefully I can pull up. Um, this is one of my favorites, just very simple and it's got some Velcro. I don't know if you can see first and then. And you have lots of choices. So we need you to participate in circle time. We need you to sit crisscross applesauce, hands in your lap. So what's going to happen after that? And then we get our snack. So we're not going to do snack now, but we'll do that after circle time. Um, and I think often when, when children hear no, if they want to eat and we say, no, no eat. Well, of course you're going to have a behavior, right? But if we say, they say eat, we say, well, first we're going to sit and listen to the story and then we get to eat. So it's coming. They know it's coming. They can see it on their card, but it's just not going to happen right this second. Um, and then visual timers are great. We use those with our members of all ages. So you can have some countdown timers. The great thing about iPhones, um, you've got all kinds of timers there. The sand timer that goes down, um, the one that reveals a picture. Although I don't know about you, Melissa, but sometimes I've had my friends get so distracted with the picture that's being revealed that they forget to do the work. <laughs> yes, that is an issue, but they really enjoy that. Yeah. It's a, it's a pleasant distraction to calm them. I have found. So um, yeah, it is distracting. This last section talking about appropriate peer relationships. And I, I find, you know, really training siblings and teaching friends, neighborhood friends, cousins, classmates, 
on how our members, what's their communication system? What's their style? How are they trying to interact with, with people around them? And then being responsive and respectful of that. Um, how are we gonna, you know, have Johnny get our attention? So it's not gonna be a smack or it's not gonna be a scream. It might be a tap, tap, tap. Um, and having boundaries with that too. On the flip side, you know, we want our young ones to be socially appropriate in how they initiate um, social contacts. But with our adults, sometimes we have the same issue. They, how many texts per day is too many texts? <laughs> um, how many phone calls, you know, a week is too many phone calls or how much do I share, uh, you know, with, with people about my personal life? Um, so that's all things that we really, we, take for granted that we learn as we go, but our members might really need that very finite, discreet, you know, teaching time um, and lots of practice because sometimes we think, oh, they've got it, they did it, and we just need, you know, practice of that over time. And the last little blurb I put on here is consistency is absolutely the most important thing. Um, because you know if you're standing in a slot machine for an hour and you don't win, you're finally, you're going to walk away. It's the time that you hit the big money, right? That, aha, that worked. And so now I'm stuck on this machine for another three hours. And that's how behavior is. That we could be doing um, everything consistently, but our spouse may not be. Or grandma who comes in may not be. Um, and, and it's hard as a parent because we get tired, we get stressed, we get overloaded. And so it, it's challenging to be as consistent as we need to be all the time. I feel your pain. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, just doing the best that we can and holding each other accountable and supporting um, all the caregivers in our child's uh, life is a good idea. So that is um, a quick overview. Thank you, Jenny and Melissa. Um, I already see a hand up, Mr. Tom. Oh, maybe I need to do it. Hold on. Let me get you here. All right, there you go. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. That, that was very informative. Um, the print was a little small for me to see. So you said earlier that we could get a copy of that presentation. Actually, what I'm what I'm going to do is, um, which I can also just send that particular document in an email, but I'm going to turn that into a blog post, and so it is going to be on the internet forever. So everyone will have access to it forever now, <laughs> and uh, so we'll, <laughs> I might even be able to get it done before this is even over and put it in the chat. Okay, yeah, I, I tried to do the chat, but it said it was disabled. Um, oh. So um, I heard what you said about posting it. So will that be on the DSL website? Yes, we will put it on the website, which that the new website should be should be um, done soon. But it'll also be on our blog. So I'll we'll we'll send it. Um, it'll be a clickable link and and an email, and then it'll we'll we'll put it on the website as well. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry about the the chat. I had it accidentally turned off. So if anyone else wants to write a question in the group chat, um, you can, or you can, un, um, I think, let me even double check. Um, you should also now be able to unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, while we're waiting, Melissa, do you have any tips for us about um, some of our um, behaviors that, that Jenny was speaking of with, um, um, defiant behavior or um... what I was going to say and reiterate what Jenny had stated regarding the verbal prompting. Um, I work with several families with kiddos with all kinds of different challenges and I found that you know less is more and what I mean by that is speak less kind of do more. So like Jenny said less is more regarding verbal prompting and what I mean by that is one two three word prompt at the most. An um, example of one word prompt would be eat. A two word prompt would be eat dinner. Um, a three word prompt would be sit down now. You know, it's something like that. It kind of sounds like cave talk, but they get it. Like Jenny said, they hear the first word and the last word. And if you don't want any confusion, you just give one verbal prompt. 
shoes. Oh, get my shoes on. Leave. Oh, we were getting ready to leave. Um, jacket on, shoes off, closed door, bedtime, bath time. It's very simple commands. And I know it sounds like cave talk, but you get a lot further because um, there's no confusion on what you're wanting them to do. Um, and regarding like with the adults, um, a lot of their avoidance is going into quote shutdown mode. Um, shutdown mode basically means I don't like what you're telling me. I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. So I'm going to shut down. And I've, I mean, actually had that happen at Down Center Louisville when transitioning from, let's say, lunch to the electives in the afternoon, especially at the end of the month. And they change their electives and they're not in the same class with their buddy or their girlfriend. So they go into shutdown mode. And I say, it's basically your choice. You can choose not to go to class, but you know, we have the movie outing or we're going to the science center tomorrow. So it's your choice. If you decide to do that, um, you're not probably going to be able to go to the science center. That's just how it is. And when they have a behavior support plan, those things can be taken away. Um, but if they choose to transition, they will for sure be able to attend the Kentucky, you know, science center or go to the movies or whatever. So I give them, you know, I set a timer on my phone and I give them about 10 minutes to process my request. But it does sometimes when they're frustrated and they're angry, they do need time to process your request, especially if they're mad um, because they don't really process that well and that quickly when they're upset. Um, so I for sure give them about 10, 15 minutes at the most. And I would say 95% of the time they make the right choice because they really want to be with their peers and go on the outings and things like that. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, it says, what do you do when your child doesn't know the word no? If we ever tell him no or not to do something, he'll do it anyway. What's the best way to handle this? Um, so if you tell him no or not to do something, he'll do it anyway. Well, the thing is, he's learned to, I guess, I mean, he's learned to really not <clears throat> listen or follow your direction. Um, so somehow that behavior has been rewarded without you even really knowing it's been rewarded. Um, so we as parents have to teach them the word no and be consistent with it and let them know no means no means I said you're not getting your red truck. You're not getting your red truck, period. And they may throw fit or whatever, but they're going to get what the word no means is because it has you're going to make sure they understand it the way they understand it. See their access to preferred activity or item or not. Jenny, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's what I heard. Well, they probably know what no means, but it just doesn't have any power over them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why I think every single time and, and using the words, and you can practice those words in play. So you have teddy bear and teddy bear's going to get your toy. You tell teddy bear, no, teddy, my toy. And so you're right. teaching what that means. Um, like role playing. Yes. And, and I want them to know the word no, because that could be a potentially self-protective word for them. Safety. So exactly. To learn the word no, because if somebody's doing something to them, they need to be able to say no. <laughs> That's not okay. Right. Um, right. And, we, and we just teach them exactly what that means in a variety of contexts. But I think what Melissa is saying is if you say it, and I've, I've told this, um, I'll throw my husband under the bus. Once you say it, when it's out of your mouth, you have to follow through. So I don't care what it is, right? He's like, oh, I said, oh, I don't care. Now you got to do it. <laughs> right, right. Well, I did this activity with the family regarding um, being respectful with the parent training with the family. And it was an activity where you... Um, got a piece of paper and had different lines on it and you got a tube of toothpaste and you squeezed out this tube of toothpaste and all these lines as fast as you could and then the next phrase was you get a little spoon and see how quickly you can put that toothpaste back in your tube of toothpaste well you can't once that toothpaste is out it really can't go back in and that's the same thing with learning what no means if once it's out there, like Jenny said, you can't take it back. So 
it is hard for parents because once you say no, that's like final. You can't say, oh my gosh, I told him I could, I wasn't going to buy him this, you know, new bicycle at Target. And then, oh my gosh, he's throwing a big fit. And now I'm under the gun and I feel all this pressure. I'm just going to have to buy it for him. No, you just walk away, walk away and say maybe later, um, maybe your birthday or Christmas or whatever. But the thing is you have to mean no and you have to stand by the word no, period. Because kids are smart. If they broke you once, they know there's a possibility they're going to break you again. Um, and it's, it can become a vicious cycle. And I think for young children, as a parent, when we say, of course, I want my child to pick up his shoes. But I'm not going to tell my child to pick up their shoes unless I'm prepared to help them pick up their shoes or to make sure that it happens. So if right. I'm on the practice on the phone doing something and I can't be present to make sure that that actually follows through and happens, I'm not going to say it right now. I might say it later. Right. Um, when they can have your full attention to provide those support. Because sometimes yeah. that's what they need. Oh, they're going to forget that I need to pick my room up. You know, and if you say, well, if you don't pick your room up, then there's not going to be any ice cream treat. Well, there you go. The, the room's not picked up. But you're like, oh, gosh, I want my ice cream treat. I want my ice cream treat. Well, did you pick up your room? No. Well, and then they throw up and then you give in to them. Then it's just like, mm, game's over. Do you think that um, it, they sh that no is just no, or should it be no hit or no, you know what I mean? Like, should, should there be another thing that goes along with it? I'm, my words are not coming to my head, but <laughs> you do know, yeah. do you know what I mean? And I've done that approach before I've said, oh, no hitting hands, uh, stay in our life. Nice hands. Um, yeah. Nice hands, you know, whatever. And you, you end on what you want them to do. Um, or you can use other words, stop. Um, what are some other inhibitory words, Melissa? I'm having a hard time at seven o'clock at night. Um, you know, you can say maybe later. Um, let's check out, check on this later. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Let's see. Uh, we're going to have more time tomorrow to get this activity done. I honestly, the, really the only time I really use no is really when it comes to safety and harm. Um, because truly no is a huge trigger for all of my folks of all ages. Because no is final. No means no means if you really know what no means, it's like, oh my gosh, I have no way to earn it back. No means no. Um, and that's what I mean for parents. If you say that, you have to stand by your guns because if not, I mean, it's going to be game on and they're going to try to break you. And if they have before, there's a chance that they're going to continue to try because it has happened before. Um, but that's why maybe later we'll check, perhaps, maybe. Um, I'll say, well, we'll wait till your dad gets home and we'll check with him. <laughs> but I, I prolong it as long as I can um, because I'm not quite sure, you know, I'm not ready to give them a no yet because I know what's going to happen. I know what a no looks like. Um, and not that I don't want to give them a no. It's just, you know, I know what the behavior is going to look like. So if I can prevent that, not saying they're going to always get their way, but they're not going to get it the time they really want it because I'm not going to be available to give it to them. This example, like my son wanted new running shoes. Well, he wanted to go to Dick's tonight and get running shoes. I'm like, honey, I'm not going to be able to tonight, but I'm going to have more time tomorrow night. So he was fine with that. If I said, no, nope, we're not getting running shoes and he's 14, he'd probably like, man, why not? You know, that type of thing. Um, but he handled it just fine. Um, so that kind of, that's how I, I handle it. Other strategies I've tried with younger children is, you know, they want something, I'll say, oh, the, the computer's sleeping, so we'll get the computer tomorrow. Computer's sleeping. Or they want to eat. Eating time's all done. You want some water? You can have right. water, but eating time's right. all done. Um, right. So you might not necessarily have to say no, but you're kind of rephrasing it, you know. Awesome. It's not gonna happen. Thank you. Um, Emily, you have your hand up, girly. Um, I think you have to, can you unmute yourself, Emily? There you go. Uh, um, I have a question about uh, my my Lisa said that some people do sometimes you can pick pick up your shoes, play by guard, or do something around in like go outside or go 
leave or do something. I don't know. Don't get so I try to figure out that I'm really good at cleaning. So like I would say, I would pick you, Carly, because you do everything from broken down crew, book clubs, and uh, that's a number of level. And this is a good point right there because now I know Marissa and Twin because I know her at Dallas and Yama Louisville. So she told me don't do active, you know, like active people aware of other people. Well, I tried not to. So I tried to say, hey, stay away. So I can't do that too. But like, and like, I'm really good at that too. Like, clean up your kitchen or do something else. So that means that you have something going on. You have to tell somebody, say, hey, do, do, uh, do this or um, clean up after yourself. Like, do it yourself, not your parents <laughs> do it. So that means that you get up, get ready, and then leave. And then sometimes you don't leave, you get more trouble. You have, uh, I can't say it. Uh, uh, you get trouble, you get trouble. So you get trouble, you turn, no, stop. Sometimes. Yeah. Stop. yeah, good point. So that point, that is good because, you know, because I get trouble. Hey, I'll tell you or Melissa and Twin or uh, genie or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know what that, that means to me, because sometimes like, uh, do this or do that or something like that. Like, uh, okay, this is weird. So yeah, so that means is like, I come get you like, hey, I can't dance because my, uh, twist my uncle or something. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. All right, I see another hand, and then we have another in, in the chat as well. Okay, I get Tom and Nancy. Hey, Nancy. Hey, I've been unmuted. I think Emily's kind of talk, talking about something to bring up because we've been talking about younger population up to this point a lot. The children are are become young adults. We are push them forward or help them to who make a lot of choices on their own. And so Emily about consequences and we try to say good consequences or bad consequences based on your choice. Sometimes it seems like there's a lot of repetitive choices. <laughs> so sometimes that's hard to kind of try to find away thing without I mean my name is no at our house. that's my name <laughs> you know, I'm the one saying no all the time <laughs> so we try Emily to do like you're saying have good consequences versus bad ones or ones that we don't like but sometimes you're you know, in the middle as a parent you're trying to let them choose and make the choices but they're not always healthy. Well, and Nancy, I would say um, to that in working with some of our adults, I love when they can identify a goal. So their goal is um, to be independent. I wanna be a self-sufficient man and move out of my house and not have my mom and dad telling me what to do. That's my goal. So then when I work with them, it's always balancing everything again. Does that support your goal? Does that choice that you made, does that support your goal? So you're, you're choosing not to get out of bed in the morning and not show up at work. Is that a behavior that an independent young man who wants to move out on his own would, does that go together? Like, no. So I, I like it when our members can have that concrete um, sort of image of what's their goal, whatever it is and then be balancing their decisions and their choices, even the most minute thing, you know, against that. Or if your goal is to lose weight and be able to lift 50 pounds, you know, okay, eating this cheeseburger and a Coke, uh, does that, does that go with that goal? Yeah. 
Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, so um, it says, Jenny, you mentioned coaching other kids like cousins how to interact with ours. Can you give some examples on that? We have a cousin that will say things like, he ruins everything. I don't want to play with him. I know it's hurtful because he adores that cousin. Yeah, yeah. And you can do some work ahead of time, or sometimes you can even just do it in the context. Uh, sometimes I'll just jump in and be there and be providing what I feel like is the running dialogue for our member. So I'll say, oh, he really likes your truck. Um, I think he, you know, you see... Noah reaching for the truck. I think he would like a turn. Can Noah have a turn now? And then the cousins, no, <laughs> it's my truck. Okay, well, we'll tell Noah one minute, you know, whatever that is. First, I'm getting to play with it, and then you get to play. So you're really in there modeling, you know, how that interaction can go. But if you want to do some work ahead of time, um, you know, you can meet with the child and say, you know. I understood time. Oh, sorry, right? my Google's going off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you can work on, no one may really want what you have, no matter what you have, he wants it. So how are we going to make sure he is sharing, you all are sharing together in a way that's not too frustrating and, and really enlist the other children in. The kids love when you ask for their input and how they're going to problem solve. And I think when they realize, oh, he's trying to be like me, or he wants mm -hmm. everything I have because I am a superhero, um, they have a different perspective on, on that. Right. It's and I, like they really help each other, really. And if the, the other cousin is older, or I mean, you know, more, quote, typical, I guess, if they're able to understand where Noah's coming from, like taking turns on a game, like shoots and ladders or Candyland, and maybe no one knocks all the pieces off and you're there to facilitate taking turns and helping him count. I think a parent being involved at the very beginning of a play date or something like that is really, you know, pretty important because Noah, you know, sometimes can be handsy, can be aggressive when he wants something and he, he has his words and we just work on our words and using words when he wants something from his cousin you know, red truck, please, or yellow Martian man, please, you know, or let's color or play doh play -Doh or whatever. I mean, just helping role, role play and facilitate that play date, I think would be huge. Um, and the more you do it, the more you can, you know, facilitate and then possibly step back and observe what's going on um, and only go in when you really need to and hopefully have the kiddo, the cousin have a little bit more freedom of how he engages or she engages with Noah. And for children who don't have siblings in their home, I love to use stuffed animals, dolls, figurines, mm -hmm. cars, whatever they love, have right. that be a, a, a person. So Teddy Bear, you know, or Buzz Lightyear stole my block. Buzz, what are you doing? <laughs> and then walking him through. So they really know, um, and they're practicing, practice, practice before, even when right. you don't have actual kids right there. Right. Great, thank you. Um, this one says, how to reduce stemming with kiddos with a dual diagnosis, for instance, hitting their head? Yeah, well, stimming is is a tricky one because again, it's that more that sensory need. And if you feel it can serve a purpose. So is hitting head frustrating? Is it what's sort of the pattern and, and what do you think the function of that hitting is? Is it purely I, I need more proprioceptive input? And so that's mm -hmm. why I'm hitting. So if you feel like that's it, finding a safe way to get some of that deep pressure. If it seems more frustrating, maybe the social demands, um, there's more voices around, we're talking to the child and that's really just overwhelming them and that's why they're hitting. Then you work on how do we provide instructions or directions with, like Melissa said, with as few words as possible. Or how do we um, engage in this activity with fewer social demands? Um, because we parents are so great at asking lots of questions. What color is this? What shape is this? What letter? Tell me this word. Blah, 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 blah. And it can be so overwhelming with or without a dual diagnosis that many kids will shut down. It's just too much. So, you know, 
the function of the hitting. And also I think some children learn like head banging on the floor. Wow, that is, that gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. And, and so parents go, <gasps> and we jump in and, and immediately, you know, comfort and conjole and provide whatever reinforcement we accidentally provide. So finding a way for them to get that need met without reinforcing it. I've, with some children, I don't know about you, Melissa, who are headbangers for attention seeking. I'll mm -hmm. just be carrying on conversation with the caregiver and slide a pillow right between their head and the floor. Don't yep. even look at you. Yep. <laughs> and it's funny. I've done how the same. Yes. You know, it's not getting attention. It stops. Now, right. self-esteem behavior, even if you get rid of one, it often will come out as something else because that's right. just the nature. Usually self-stimming behavior is sort of a calming in many Soothing ways. mechanism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so finding a safe and socially appropriate way to self-soothe uh, without, and still meet that need. Because I, as a parent of a child with a dual diagnosis, you think, yay, I extinguished that behavior. Boing! It's like whack-a-mole. It just kind of yeah. pops up as something else. Right. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Emily, you had a turn, so I'm going to let someone else have a turn, okay? Okay. Who else? Are there any other things, Melissa, that popped into your mind when, when Jenny was talking that um, have worked well for you? Um, um, I, I just worked with a family today um, that they have a kiddo that he th has big meltdowns. Whenever he's told no or he doesn't get his way, he throws major tantrums. And mom's like, you know, we need to work. This is one thing that we need to work on. And this was my third session with this little kiddo. And he saw me pull up and he had a meltdown um, because of the last session. Um, and I try to really pair myself with positive reinforcement with my kiddo, especially at first, because when you pair yourself with positive reinforcement, they want to see you, they want to engage with you. And then I, you know, kind of sneak in some test demands and I don't even know I'm doing it. Um, but unfortunately, our session last week was wonderful at the beginning. And then he didn't get his way towards the end. And mom had told him that she didn't want him going across the street to play with friends. And he threw this big fit and ran, ran out the front door and ran. They live out in the country. Um, so I told mom to stay where she was. And I went after him, not aggressively, just walked to make sure to watch him. And he was throwing a big fit, crying, screaming. And I made sure he was safe, um, but didn't give him any attention, really. No, no real eye contact. I could see where he was. He was safe. Um, and then he kind of whimpered down. Um, and um, he said, I want to go to my friend's house. And I said, after I leave, friend's house. Ah! Um, and it was about time for me to leave anyway. So I had to physically prompt him to make the right choice. Um, and he, he's like, I think three or four. And um, so I got him underneath the arms and kind of walked him across the road. And he's starting to fit and I'm ignoring it. And we're still physically prompting across the road. And then um, I bring him to the front porch and then he runs to mom. And um, so what I told mom is when he starts to have these big meltdowns, the big thing that I think to focus on is change the environment, you change the behavior. And if he wants to have a meltdown and a tantrum, that's fine, truly. But he can have it in his bedroom. Um, the living room, mom and dad's room, the kitchen is quiet zone. And if if you want to have a meltdown and you want to cry and pitch a fit, you could do that in the privacy of your own room. So that's what we did today. He saw me pull up. He's screaming. I come in and I don't even acknowledge what he's doing, but I talked to mom and dad briefly and I said, he needs to be removed to his room. And mom's like, oh yeah, that's right. So they removed him. I'm not kidding. It was three minutes because I used my timer. He was calm. He had calmed down in three minutes because no longer was he attention seeking. He was in the privacy of his own room. He calmed himself down. And that's the thing too, because dad's like, well, do we really want to do that? And I said, the thing is, he, I think he's four. He'll be five. He's going to be going to kindergarten. I said, the thing that we need to teach, teach our kiddos is self-soothing. So if we're always there for them, if we're always the one they're going to run to, they're not going to be able to run to us at preschool and elementary school 
they're going to have to learn to self-soothe themselves. And that's what we're working on. And it's like a light bulb went off in the parents. And they're like, oh, it's perfect. You're right. And it is because our kiddos need to learn that because we're not always going to be there to soothe them. What, which, you know, we would love to be, but it's not practical. So three minutes, he calmed down. And I went back in his room um, and said, are you ready to play? Ah! Screamed. And I'm like, okay, when you're ready to come out, because he wanted to have a snack. And I'm like, you can have your snack. Um, and then mom just stood outside the door and said, are you ready for a snack? And he said, yes, please. Um, and he came out, had his snack. And it was like, win-win, no cries, no throwing a fit. He was happy as a lark. And at the end of the session, we played cars a little bit with his little racetrack. And then I left. Um, so it was a win-win for everyone. So now mom and dad, when he, he throws a fit, he's going to his room. And mom had asked me, you know, what if this happens at Target or if it happens at the park and things like that? I said, same type of concept. You know, if you and dad are at the park and he throws a fit because Jimmy John took his swing from him and spit on him or whatever, or he did that to someone and throws a fit, you either can remove him to another part of the park or you can remove him to get a break like maybe at a park bench or something and then bring him back to it. Um, same thing at Target. I mean, I've had to do this personally. When my, with my son was younger, at a Target, he threw a fit so bad because I wouldn't give him the sleeping bag that he wanted or whatever, I can't remember. Um, so I had to leave my cart at Target, customer service, and I said, I'll be back in 15 minutes. I gotta take my son home to my husband and I'm coming back to get my cart. And yes, it's inconvenient, but you know what? It's like, I'm not tolerating that behavior, period. Um, so those are some things that you can do um, with the tantruming and things like that. And, and it's effective. Um, I've seen many families use it and um, they've been very um, successful with it. And when children realize they are not going to burst into flames, you know, over a tantrum, it, it's wonderful. I, you know, okay, yes, you were upset, but you calm down, and I give a lot of praise. I try not to harp on, oh gosh, remember this morning when you da 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 da, you know, or if you're gonna you're gonna focus on the positive. Wow, you you took some deep breaths, you got nice and calm, you got your snuggly, right. great work. So focusing on the positive, but right. um, with Melissa, I've had to use these same principles with my children when they were younger and not often because once they realized I'm in business, mm -hmm. but we've done the time out in the car at a restaurant. You know, my yep. family had to leave my family and my husband and the other kids in the restaurant and go sit in the car with the two-year-old and let them have it, you know, have it out there. But that's right. the only time it happened because... Right. And I think having this discussion with the other caregivers in your world is really important because it's, it's almost like a game of chess. You got to know how far you're going to carry this out. Our, and right. we, my husband and I often say, okay, what's the end game? <laughs> you know, right. how far, if he does this, we do that. If he does it, we do that. You know, that's um, right. Playing it out. That's right. And one thing I was going to mention too, with some of our adults, and I don't know if you found this, um, Melissa, sometimes with our adults with behaviors, especially, you know, um, with, with OCD type behavior, some of that can increase as our members mm -hmm. get older. Um, and if it's a behavior that is going to be really hard to extinguish, I encourage caregivers to just put parameters around it. So right. we know, you know, we're not going to get our friends to necessarily learn maybe what's socially appropriate in texting, but we do know we only text our friends, you know, so many times a day, whatever you decide is acceptable, or we don't text after nine o'clock, or, um, you know, I, I'm even thinking of one of our adults who has um, dementia, unfortunately, and she, one of her anxiety things was she wanted to rearrange furniture in the home. Mm -hmm. And she lived in a residential facility. And of course, they can't have, you know, the staff can't <laughs> be rearranging her furniture every day. So, you know, one of my recommendations was let's have a, she likes her calendar and her schedule. So Sunday, unfortunately, Sunday staff, that Sunday is the day that we're allowed to move some things. Or mm -hmm. you say, okay, you can move one piece a day. Right. You, know, you just put some parameters around it to make it manageable right. um, for everybody. Right. Anyone else? I've got our chat open here if anyone has any other questions. And uh, one thing that I want to talk to you guys about too is, you know, when Jenny was talking about discipline, 
and this is another thing that I touch base with with the same family. And I don't know if Jenny finds this true, but I do find that in a family dynamic with a mom and dad or you know, two caregivers or whatever, it's good to have a head coach and an assistant coach. I like to do sports analogies because I'm into sports. So if you have a head coach, which means the head coach is the lead disciplinarian. So pretty much whatever the head coach says, pretty much goes. And the assistant coach backs up the head coach. Like for instance, my family, I'm a head coach. So my husband will say, well, whatever your mom said and whatever your mom said that goes. So there's no question. Um, Cause I do have some families that mom and dad are not on the same page and it causes friction. And then the kids know it and they play the parents against each other. And it causes all kinds of troubles and challenges when it doesn't need to happen. Um, so I, I found that simple Simple Sally. It's so easy. One person be in charge and the other one backs up the other one. Now, if you do have a disagreement, you go to huddle time, which is in closed quarters, office, bedroom, bathroom, whatever you got to go and have a conversation. And think your side, well, you know, maybe we could go to Kings Island this weekend. Well, no way. We're not going to Kings Island this weekend. You know, so have that conversation in private and then come back to your team, which are your kiddos, and say, look, this is what we've decided because you need to have a united front. Because again, kids will badger you to death. Well, mom said, dad said, well, there's no confusion. Mom said no. And dad says, mom said no, period, whatever. So I do find that that really eliminates a lot of challenges with families. When you do like have a head coach, assistant coach, or a president and a vice president type thing, it does somewhat simplify the disciplinarian portion of the, you know, parenting and so on. Yeah, and grandparents should be on that team too, or in the coaching staff as well. Yeah, they should be the, they <laughs> the should teachers. be the assistants, assistants. <laughs> yeah, the teachers. I mean, everybody really needs to be on the same page, and that, that becomes really challenging because grandparents want to just spoil, 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 and I think that's wonderful to a certain extent. Then it becomes challenging when the parents work so hard to put some boundaries in place and put some structure in place. And then it all goes out the window when it goes to Grammy and grandpa's house. And that's challenging. And some families are like, well, we can't send Johnny over there. If you're not going to keep tight boundaries like we do here. Well, he can't have a cookie. No, we're not having a cookie, but he could have a granola bar or, or you know, a sherbet or something, you know, something more healthy, but, yeah, we all got to be on the same page because, you know, success is teamwork and you got to work as a team to make it work successfully. And that's why I love having a plan. Um, and even if you need it in writing, I'll often take this as our, our template and tweak it for families that meet their individual situation because we're agreeing on the plan instead of agreeing or not agreeing with each other. Um, right. And and a lot of times, especially with grandparents, it's like, well, I was raised. Well, you yes. know, unfortunately, <laughs> the yes. world's a different place. Times you know? have changed. And, right. And I, I will say for our members, too, I, I say Down syndrome um, explains behavior, but it doesn't excuse behavior. Correct. So whatever your expectation for all of your children, um, you would have that expectation. So it's not okay that just because he has extra chromosome, he can smack people or throw things or kick the dog. That's, it's not okay. Now we might get there a different route. It might explain, yeah, he has some sensory seeking needs or he doesn't he always use his words, but it explains, I would say it explains it. It doesn't excuse it. And we'll get there. It just might be with some different strategies. Right. Okay, I've got I've got Polly's question here. Um, he loves to flip over chairs. He can pull up the table and likes to walk around the table and knock over chairs. He'll do it when he's scooting around. He'll scooter over the chairs and knock them over. He seems to love exploring them and likely likes the input. And he will do it with all the chairs in the home. I worked with deep pressure input and throwing balls. Just not sure what else to do to help him learn that flipping over chairs is not appropriate. Yeah. Um, one great way, if you can change the environment so he can't, I mean, this may seem hard, but it would be temporary. So if you can somehow take a jump rope, tie the chairs together so he can't flip them, 
and you can manage that for several days, week, what, however long, so that every time mm -hmm. he's pushing, nothing's happening. And then immediately redirect them to some other type of activity, whether it's joint compressions. I love joint compressions. What's a um, joint compression? That's where you're providing, you, you stabilize the elbow and then you're providing some gentle pressure through the hand to get to that zippy feeling in the wrist, elbow and shoulder. And you can do it through the legs as well. Um, you know, heavy work. I've got a list of like a hundred different heavy work activities if you want it, lifting, pushing, pulling, Lycra mm -hmm. bands are great if they want to pull. Um, I love Lycra bands in the car. You tie them to the headrest of the seat in front of the child because being in the car, you're strapped in, you're sedentary. It can be a long time. Right. So you can pull and get some of that deep pressure work because otherwise I'm usually seeing toys and shoes and glasses getting chucked all over the car. Um, right. But it's a great way to do some heavy work in a sedentary environment. So those would be some initial thoughts. Um, Melissa, how about you? Well, it would be good to try to replace that behavior with something appropriate. I'm trying to think what that would be. Um, if there is like, I don't know, like some type of toy or um, something kind of heavy and substantial. I mean, you know, I was thinking about like a, they make those kitty punching bags. Um, that you put sand at the bottom and you can push that mm -hmm. and that would be the same type of input He's pushing something down, but it's appropriate and you could put that outside in the garage or out in the grass And he could you know, you could redirect them if he's going after the chairs Redirect, you know, I keep them tied up for a while till that becomes distinguished But replace it with something that he's still getting that same type of input that pushing mechanism so they make those, you blow them up, because McKinley, my son used to have one, you put sand at the bottom, you blow them up, and he can push all day on that thing and still get the same type of input, and, and it's appropriate, and it's age appropriate, and it's safe. So that would be something that I would be looking into to replace that. Um, so. And they even have some of the child punching bags, the little yes. tyke bags that you could hit yes. at and they just make sure he doesn't <laughs> whack him in the face yeah. but yeah something to replace that behavior with is what i would be looking into um okay so we have about 10 minutes left i wanted to ask specifically if anyone wants to maybe chime in or we can just have jenny and melissa answer but what about um has anyone seen new behaviors because since we've been in lockdown, that's kind of one of the reasons that we had um, this session is because um, it seemed like several families were saying, oh my gosh, I'm seeing new things. And um, so I didn't know if anyone had something specific or if um, Jenny, Melissa just kind of wanted to jump in if, if maybe you've gotten some calls from families or emails. Um, the biggest so one that I've gotten is um, no schedule, no structure, because um, they're so used to that. And, you know, kiddos are, adults are, kiddos are. And I think DSL's done a great job with having those days filled with, you know, um, Boogie Down, you know, all the DSL different types of classes you guys have, book clubs, as much as they can have structure. And if you have to do a, a visual calendar, because kiddos in the classroom, from kiddo all the way up to adult, they're used to seeing a visual schedule. So my parents, they could just get a wipe off board and just write the words. And even though maybe the kiddos don't know what it says, the parents can say, okay, nine o'clock we're having breakfast. You can put like, you know, a picture of food or something and go through the list of the day so they know what to expect. And it gives their day purpose and structure for the day because that's what what's what we all want when we're not really structured it's like you know chaos so to speak and it's been a little crazy so that's those are the things that i work with my families on and it doesn't have to be like every 15 minutes it can be you know every hour every couple hours or you could just have you know part of the day but this part of the day we're going to do maybe some fun educational and then this part of the day we're going to have lunch and then we're going to be outside you know going for a hike looking for dandelions, counting dandelions, counting how many weeds we have in the flower garden, you know, whatever. How weed the garden, you know, different things like, that. you know, the pool, sprinkler, you know, water balloons, 
there's so many different things that they can do and that and that gets them tired too and they don't sleep really good um and sleep has been another issue with some of my kiddos because they're not as active and you know they're not as tired so it's hard to get them to sleep so those are the type of questions that i've had um from my families that i've been working with yeah and then enlist help. I know it's hard, especially if you're a single parent or one of you has to be away from the home working while one of you is trying to be in the home working. Um, if you have neighbors, especially high school age, trusted neighbors, family members who can come over, just fill in uh, a little time here and there. I think that's a good distraction for, for everyone, um, but it kind of keeps them on a schedule. And it's hard for our energy to be up all day with kids. Um, especially when we're trying to multitask during the day. So it, don't be afraid to ask for, for help. Right. Sure. It looks like Camilla has a question. It's Ellie. Ellie, you have a question? Oh, Ellie. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, okay, so my question is, I, um, when, 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 I'm at home and um um I let's see I um um how to do when um um uh when okay so like so one of my chores is doing the the the, the uh, dishes and i don't i do not i i do not want to do that because because i i don't like doing that and and i and i and I um I kind of have to so I just I just I just do it in any ways and uh and the other thing is that um is that I like to stay stay up late um and um i like to watch my shows at, at night and i i like to well i decide to sleep downstairs in the in the uh living room on the couch and and my and my mom does does not does not she does not does she does not not she she does not like that and um and I, I and and I, I do that and I I stay I stay up and I don't get to I don't get to go to bed at, at like four o'clock in the morning and i don't get e enough sleep and at night um i go i go downstairs to get to get food out of the with refrigerator and 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 bring it to my room and and I, 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 
y hay y y y hay a hay a y eat it and my and 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 um wow my mom she, she does not she, she does not like that she doesn't want want me to eat food in my room yeah so you have several things you might be working on there right ellie several behaviors Oh, sorry. So, sorry. yeah. So one thing, um, and I know we can probably talk more in detail later, but I, that's why I love having a goal because we all kind of would just love to do whatever we want, right? And um, I don't want to do dishes either. I'd love to stay up late and sleep on the couch and eat junk food late at night. That's that sounds good to me. But but my goal really is to have a healthy body and a healthy brain. And I know a lot of those things I just described don't go, don't get me to my goal of a healthy body and brain. So I know a good night's sleep, which is usually in our bed, um, helps my brain. That's for sure one of the best things you could do. Not eating after a certain time at night, not eating after nine o'clock at night, that's good for my body and my brain. So, you know, making some of those decisions. Um, I don't like doing the dishes either, but I'll tell you a secret of what I do, Ellie. If there's a task around my house that I don't want to do, I set up a little reward system for myself after. So I often will say I'll vacuum and then I'm going to have a cup of hot tea because I love my hot tea. Or I'm going to do my dishes and then I'm going to go outside and get some fresh air on the porch. So I kind of, those are things that I enjoy. You would have to pick things that you enjoy. But, you know, once you do your job, give yourself a little tiny reward, you know, whatever that that is. Absolutely. And I know that when I, Ellie, when I go to sleep at four o'clock in the morning, ooh, I do not feel good the next day at all. And usually I'm in a bad mood the next day <laughs> if I stay up too late. Absolutely. Okay. Does anyone have any last, last questions? I think we're about to wrap up. Um, Thank you so much, Jenny and Melissa. Now I'll tell everyone one more time, just so we're, um, everyone knows in case anyone came late, I will take the document that Jenny, um, that we were looking at during this and I'm right now, I'm going to put it into our blog. So I'll, I'll post that um, and we'll put it in an email with a clickable link and hopefully there will also be a link to a recording of this session. Um, and then I'll also include Melissa's information and Jenny's information if anyone has more, um, more in detailed questions or if questions pop up. So uh, ladies, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I learned a ton too. You're welcome. Yes, thank you so much. Everyone have a great night and stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks.